The first object that we found was a doll's head that we picked up on Milneton Beach, myself and my daughter's dad, and so we called her Millie. Her body began to grow, so we found her leg. And then the whole cast of characters evolved from there. The whole process of finding these little objects and transforming them became almost like a process of divination, like a process of finding meaning. I kind of was obsessed by the mystery of the things and where they had come from because there was so much. Nice tongue here for a cow. This is just a, a box of bits that have been collected off the beach. They feel like they're called to you because they've been loved and held and like sort of invested with a certain energy and that energy hasn't really been released. I mean it hasn't gone anywhere. And then these are two chimpanzees that I was playing with. This light fitting it looks a bit like a pith helmet to me. Some old bits of plumbing, and this is a squash ball. And then a pair of kind of Halloween vampire teeth. So then what I'd do is I'd look for a body for this little guy. And that is a double adapter. Sort of come together to make a little chimpanzee with his bow tie and his little legs. And then we've got to decide whether he's a boy or a girl. And maybe he has a partner. We'll have to try and find the rest of her though. And do you want to see this little guy? He was the go away demon. His eyes are made out of um, flip flops that were found on the beach and then cut into circles. So it... and he had a mane and his willy is made out of an ant. Where's her other leg? So he's a, a travelling, a little traveller. Bye. I feel like I have to rescue them because they've been abandoned and there were these kind of loved things that are now unwanted. they like orphans. But at the same time, there's an unknown quality about them. I'm never quite sure whether they're nice or not nice, but I can't ignore them. When I first moved to Scarborough, it was like a gift to me to be given this resource, this interesting thing that I could make work out of. But Suns Beach 30, 40 years ago was the municipal dump because this area was very unpopulated. So it's filled with all the suburban rubbish of the surrounds. It feels like a cemetery in some way. It's like a burial ground for a suburban reality. So it looks like it could be like a little bonnet for a puppet or a little sculpture. And if there was like a kind of a lay story around the back there, it would look almost like, you know, like Whistler's wife or something like that. It's quite nice. Walking on this beach and finding these things becomes like a kind of an archaeology. All of these little objects are like a record of somebody's life passing. I was walking on the beaches and collecting stuff and then at one point I became aware of the fact that there was a sort of an organised rubbish collecting endeavour going on and that there were groups of women with yellow plastic bags like removing rubbish at quite an alarming rate for me because it would become a resource for me. So the idea of people actually having sort of first option on, the, on, on my junk um, initially quite upset me and I had to sort of war with myself to to allow 
<laughs> for it to be okay. I discovered that it was been done by a local environmental organisation and then I met the person who was coordinating the cleanup campaign. He knew that I made my own found objects and junk sculptures, but he approached me to design or to find out whether I had um, designed any products that could be reproducible. Simultaneously what had happened is that there had been quite a lot of storms and I'd noticed that there were really a lot of plastic lids and so I'd started playing with those lids. I was cleaning the beaches but I didn't know that I can make something out of it. But um, when Mani came around she was showing us how to do something out of recycling. It was amazing. And now we're getting so famous that we couldn't stop making things now. <laughs> When I was introduced to the woman from Kierg, I felt like I'd been given a, a social connection. I think for all of us, there was a process of kind of social recovery, like feeling like what we had innately was something that was valuable, that made us useful human beings. We would sit together and work with these unwanted things, kind of reclaiming their worth, and at the same time, kind of reclaiming our own sense of self-worth. Through, through using these things in creative ways. I think one of the nicest moments for me was when there was a big argument that broke out amongst a group of people about a packet of lids that somebody had collected and left and that they'd been stolen by somebody else to take home and make a bead screen curtain. And it was uh, um, a, lot of, a lot of conflict. People were arguing and I, we had a meeting, a conflict resolution meeting, and I said to people, it's great. Like we've actually, we've performed a magical feat. Like we've turned these lids into money. It's like, this is alchemy. The emphasis shifted once the product started being mass produced from the kind of walking on the beach to more like a little factory. When we made the, the curtain, our first curtain, I didn't have confidence of like going and sell that in town. But amazingly enough is that uh, when we took that cat into African Image, the owner was so thrilled, was like, wow, this is the best product ever. I changed that moment that through junk, I can live a better life, you know, yeah. Ultimately, the woman wanted to work independently. They didn't want to have to come into work every day and they wanted to be able to work from home. So Jandiswa produces for orders on an ongoing basis. She has got her own set of, of retailers and she exports. It's like a dream come true, you know. Um, even me, the house that I have, I used to stay in a very small shack, but now through making things out of junk and uh, like selling them, then I have managed to put myself a, a little bit bigger house, you know. What I'm doing here is I'm busy putting together a prototype. So what I'll, what I'll do when I'm making a prototype is I'll work quite intensely on one thing until I feel like it's got the look that I want and then kind of work out the recipe and then break it down into components and then outsource the components. And then Yandiswa works with, I think, about eight women now. And they produce all the components for me, and then I put those things together with, uh, with help from maybe the two most experienced women in that group. We attach our status, social status, to objects and the objects that you have or don't have. So that for objects generally to become meaningless, and then become reinvested according to one's own set of needs is quite liberating. It's just about anything that you sit down and 
fiddle with for long enough turns into something else.